Well, I finally did it, folks. I built a Ryzen. That's right. Just not a modern one. I built the Ryzen of 1999. AMD's Athlon K7 Slot A. So let's have a look at that build, shall we? This rebuild has been in the works for a couple years now. I've been slowly recollecting a few parts which had originally been installed in this system that got broke or lost or whatever since then. Well, I do have a couple complete slot A Athlon systems laying around here. I wanted to rebuild a system that I originally built back in 1999 just for the heck of it. If nothing else, it makes for a nice baseline slot A system for future comparisons. This case was initially the home of my Celeron 366A, which was combined with a Soyo 6BA Plus 3 motherboard to allow for overclocking the piss out of that processor. Later in 1999, I upgraded the system to the Athlon, and I ended up actually getting another uh, ATX case for the Athlon, which was one of those translucent green cases, which I thought was kind of cool back then. I don't have that case any longer, and I haven't had it for a very long time. I gave it to a friend many, many years ago. And I kind of wish I hadn't done that because now, since I have this channel, I'd like to showcase that case again because I don't see them for sale and I don't see anybody that's ever had one of those on YouTube. So it would have been kind of cool to do that. But anyway, I can't. This FIC SD11 motherboard was the first board that was available to actually buy for the slot A processors. When those chips hit the market, there were no motherboards available, and motherboards did become uh, mm, slowly to trickle in for sale, um, usually still being hard to find for a few months after the processor was initially released. Eventually, companies like Asus finally got their boards to market, and VS chipset became available as a better option to the initial Iron Gate chipset from AMD. The AMD K7 and IronGate chipset was AMD's first complete in-house platform to compete with Intel. The IronGate chipset was not perfect, but I've never found it to be unstable, unless you try to enable a slightly bugged Northbridge to run its AGP bus at 2x instead of the single speed that it was relegated to. I'm sure that this was due to needing to get their chipset out in time for motherboards to be available when the processor was released, which didn't really actually happen quite as they had planned, or hoped, I'm sure. The SD11 was criticized for being a large, yet sparsely populated board, often being thought of as resembling a pre-production prototype board. FIC was not the only company to use this large footprint for their slot A board. The ASUS K7T board was also a big girl, though it has a lot more things taking up the space. I think the OEM version of the SD11 designed for Compaq is actually the better of the two versions. This version has a superior voltage regulation section for the processor with twice as many regulations going on for the processor as the retail board has. Yes, they're spreading the love to the processor around a little bit more with having more VRs. And probably a little more stable power delivery as well doing that. The empty pads on the retail SD11 are populated on the compact version with all kinds of goodies for the firewire. Uh, along with the firewire header on the back of the board. Oh, and of course the board is green. The compact version has a slightly more limited BIOS, of course. Not that the retail BIOS is anything special itself, but I think the retail BIOS should work on the compact board unless there's something done with the hardware on the board for some reason to prevent that from happening. At least the BIOS chip is removable on the board to test this idea if I felt like it. I'm not going to use this board though other than for testing. I just wanted to use the original board that I well put in this box nearly 20 years ago. It'll be more for testing comparisons things like that in the future but I just wanted to build my original system at this point in time. The Athlon 550 is going into this system, and this was a chip that I had to find another one of, as my original one got a bit broken from taking the cap off a few too many times. 
The 550s at the time I got this were not terribly cheap. This one was a good price combined with the motherboard, the compact board as a matter of fact. I found a nice little bundle there. Um, but they have been come a little bit cheaper lately. Not too much. Sometimes you find a good deal. There's like some 700s right now on eBay that are pretty cheap, like 10 bucks. Um, but I've got a few of those already, so I don't need to buy any more. Um, I also got a 500 as well, which seems to be kind of a rare, a little bit more rare or hard to find speed for some reason. Um, but I'm going to use that more for testing purposes than anything else again as well. For Ethernet, I'm going to use the trusty 3Com 305TX. These cards work with pretty much anything, unless they go bad. And I'll use my original Sound Blaster Live that it had in this system. It came in one of those uh, value kits that with a provided with a CD-ROM and speakers. I was tempted. I thought about it for a while to use my Santa Cruz, but I think I'll save this for another project. Plus, I need to test this card to see if it even meets with my approval. It should. It's got two DACs on it, which is pretty cool. It should have a pretty decent sound, but I've heard this card is better for music than gaming. I don't know. So, for the time being, I'm just going to use what I know. That would be the Sound Blaster Live. This is going to be a Windows 98 machine. And this will not be a problem. As far as the video card goes, that is something that I have not shown on this channel. At least I don't think I have. I've had this little beauty for a year now. Got this for a very good price on eBay. And it does work. Nice Rage Fury Max card. Now, originally back in the day when this was my main system, I was running my Diamond Viper V770 Ultra in it. But I think I'd rather go with this card this time. I haven't actually experienced this card yet. And I would like to do that. So I think this will be a nice match for the Slot A Athlon processor. And I guess it's kind of fitting since AMD would eventually own ATI. So this would be kind of like an all AMD system, right? Well, minus the video card, or the Ethernet card and the sound card anyway, but nevertheless. Hey, and at least this motherboard actually has a genuine AMD chipset on it, unlike the Socket 7 board that they came out with uh, prior to this. So yeah, anyway, we've got this thing quite empty still, and but we are making progress, so... Let's continue with the build. With a heatsink already attached to this processor, I just decided to run it without a fan because a lot of times you can't really put a fan on these heat sinks because the fins aren't made to hold a fan. So I'm just going to let the, the uh, dual fans on the power supply keep it cool. There should be enough airflow, I think, around there. I don't know. This is the way Compaqs and HPs did it back in the day for slot processors, the gateways as well. Um, they'd have a duct going from the fan on the power supply and went around, uh, shrouded around the uh, processor heatsink there. So you have one fan cooling both the processor and the and the uh, power supply, which kept the system quiet. And it usually worked pretty well. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do here. If I have to put some fans on it, you know, I will. Well, we're trying to keep with the good luck and the rapid pace of assembly here. 
And the side cover has been left off because you know good and well that when you put the side cover on, that means something's probably not going to work. So, I won't want to push our luck too much here. I know everything should work. It did at one time. But, you know. I'm going to flip the switch here. And where's the power button on this thing? I see I'm going to have to flip the power light. That hard drive does not sound good. Yep, yeah, so that's a bad Mac store hard drive. And we'll just have to go with something else, I guess. So I guess I'll try this 20 gig Western Digital drive. If I have any better luck, I'm going to have to put a jumper on it, though. Is this jumper for a single or master? No, that should work. Single or master. Yep, that, that's for slave presence. So, nope, I'm good on that. Let's see if this drive is any better. This is one of the reasons why I like not putting all the screws in, because it makes it easier to remove the drive. I dislike removing side panels and try to avoid it as much as I can. Alright, we are still powered up. I guess I'll change my, flip my uh, power LED around here. I got the hard drive one right. Now we're lit up. That sounds a little better. Maybe not. We're still working. And that hard drive sounds a little like it's got some miles on it. Let's go ahead and load up. Well, let's do a setup here. Go back to the beginning of time as far as the motherboard is concerned. 1999. Primary Masters Auto. And it does recognize it, but I don't like the sound of it. Let's see if there's anything on there. Oh, we got Windows 2000 on there. Look at that. And it did not want to boot up, of course. Okay, well, let's see if I can find a little bit quieter drive. Well, at least I know this BIOS does not have a uh, 8 gigabyte limitation, at least. So I might cram my 120 in there. We'll see. Maybe it's got an 8 gig limitation. I don't know. But I'll find something. When I started running benchmarks on this system, uh, it was unable to complete 3D Mark 2000, kicking back to the desktop halfway through, so I figured the processors were probably getting a little bit too warm. So in an attempt to run benchmarks on this system, uh, I kept having the 3D Mark 2000 uh, unexpectedly just quit back to the desktop. And I suspected it probably was the fact that this processor is just getting too hot. And indeed it was pretty warm still even after being turned off for about 10 or 15 minutes there. So the power supply, the fans, and that thing are just not either in the right position or just not pulling enough air to make a, much of a difference in uh, cooling this processor. So... I've got some brand new Cooler Master fans here. I'm going to add two of them. Unfortunately, I'm kind of stuck at the moment trying to find screws because I've only been able to find those two. You know, I remember pulling those fans off with all the some of the Pentium 2 heat sinks that I got and all the extras that I didn't need. And you think I would remember what I did with the screws, and they're not in the boxes, so... One of those fun things. Anyway... 
So the daggum thing still crashed and the uh, processor is definitely pretty kind of warm but it's not uh, it's not really out of this world. But that north bridge might be where the problem is because I got that sucker eh, get it just right there. I had 150 a minute ago. Let's see if I can find it. Where there it is, right there. 151. I'm gonna have to get a cooler on that AMD Northbridge chip there. Yeah, I hope that fixes it. If not, maybe I'm just gonna have to try a different board. The uh, Max is not getting hot at all. The GPUs are quite happily cool. Just slightly warmer than my skin, so I don't know. Well, adding that little green heat sink to the North Bridge seems to have been what fixed it. I actually got through a run of 3D Mark 2000 this time. Cool. So here's a few benchmarks that I ran in the system for what they're worth. Quake 3 scores for this speed processor is about right, I guess. I don't know. It's doing about 43 frames per second here. Which is definitely playable. I mean, that's what I played on back then and killed a lot of people doing it. Uh, we're running 1024, 768, 32-bit color here. And I seem to recall my dual Pentium Pros actually doing a score about this score. 42, 43 frames per second. Um, but I don't remember exactly what the situation was with the settings that I had set it to to get that. I don't really remember. But anyway, it's uh, it's it's doing uh, it's it's fine for me. I I probably wouldn't be playing Quake 3 in the system anyway. So.
Expendable, on the other hand, runs very well. We're averaging right at 60 frames per second, which is nice to see. Minimum frame per second is in the 40s, but that's certainly not a killer by any means. Expendable is one of those few games back in the day that still holds up pretty well to today's standards of what things look like and how things play and things like that. Especially if you're looking at games that are on tablets and phones and stuff like that. It still looks pretty modern, I think. So I'm going to do a little bit of gaming at this point on this system. Uh, the first one I'm going to be playing here is Unreal Tournament. So I'm going to be playing my, well, shall we say, favorite level of Unreal Tournament. Um, bear in mind, I did forget to change the keyboard layout. So I'm playing with the default keys, and I had to kind of sit there and think about what those were, because I'm used to the WASD stuff. So let's go ahead and play a little bit of Unreal Tournament for a while here. On this level, I don't feel like I'm needing any more hardware to get the job done. I'm blazing through these computer bots um, very well. And I did back in the day. Was, you know, this is how things ran. And it runs pretty good on this system. So, yeah, this is uh, Unreal Tournament's uh, it, fine enough, definitely playable. I can, I can frag with the best of them on this.
Congratulations, you are the winner. One day I will have to purchase this game because I think it's worth it. I think it's worth giving the guy that wrote this a few bucks. And I'd like to see uh, beyond the, was it, four or five levels or something like that this thing gives you. But it's actually, you know, you get a little bit of fun, you know, a little bit of time out of this, even though it's a demo. I definitely recommend checking this out. Um, and, uh, yeah, seeing what you think of it. I might do a video on this at some point. I've got a few ideas on gaming videos I'd like to do including some live streams so this might be one of those that I do <laughs> Jazz Jackrabbit 3D. I'll play another interesting game here on the system. This is Jazz Jackrabbit 3D. This is another fun game, and it was unofficially uh, released in beta form by the company before they went bust. Unfortunately, it was never officially released or sold in, a, in some kind of a final version. It's unfortunate, I think, because this is a real fun game, and I think it looks really good. It runs very well in the system, as you can see. This is another game that is definitely worth your time to screw around with, I think, if you if you want something different. It kind of reminds me of N64 game, really. The menus have a similar look to Earthworm Jim, which is said to be the game that this was, or that was used as an influence to this game, I guess. I don't know. It kind of feels more like Banjo Kazooie, though, to me, in a lot of ways. But anyway, the Athlon and the Fury Max have no problem at all blowing through this game.
Well, this certainly is an interesting combination of processor and video card, combined with the Northbridge, known to be quirky with video cards, operating only at single AGP speed. Nevertheless, the system is very responsive, games run very well, and so far have been rock solid. Not one crash since adding the Northbridge heatsink. After having now experienced the Rage Fury Max for myself in the system, gaming with it, installing the drivers, things like that, I can say this card is certainly one of the cards that I would recommend for someone wanting a good performing video card for this era of build. Probably would do just fine uh, up to a gigahertz processor or perhaps a bit more. The stability of this card has been great. I've had no issues with it on this Iron Gate chipset, which is saying a lot actually. And the fact that you don't have to try multiple driver versions to get the best performing one like you do with some of the NVIDIA cards. Um, this is definitely one that's worth having a look at. Uh, it's a good card, if you can find it. You know, it's one thing to run a lot of benchmarks on these cards, but it's quite another to actually take some time and use them and just see how they work. And this is, like I said, definitely one that I would recommend taking a look at, at least if you want something different and not always playing the NVIDIA game all the time. I am toying with the idea of doing a Let's Play or a live stream or something like that with some gaming, maybe some system builds in the future. Um, and this box will probably be used for some of that live streaming if I decide to do it in the future. But yeah, I'm quite happy with how this has turned out. And uh, I've got more builds coming up on this channel. I've got a Celeron build and another Dual Pentium 3. Yes, that's right. And I actually may switch that out because I found another board for the Pentium 3 that I want to try that I think is going to be better. We will see. I don't know. Anyway, this is the Wayback Tech signing off. Peace out, everybody.